And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from Evil Genius Games, previously known for the f the D20 Modern meets 5e e expansion known as, well not expansion, just insanity, known as Everyday Heroes, now coming back with two of their cinematic adventure paths, with um, Isle of the Dam representing Kong Skull Island, and Dominion of Iron representing Pacific Rim. The one and only Siegfried, he doesn't have Roy, but he is Trent. <laughs> Greetings, everybody. It is an honor to worship at your altar, uh, Mildred. Thank you for inviting me back to the temple. Thank you for thank you for coming back. <laughs> I had to make... I'm pretty sure you get the Siegfried and Roy joke a, a bunch, but I had to do it. Oh, yeah, from time to time. I mean, it's actually helpful because people see my name and, and they're like, Whoa, what, what strange combination of letters is this? Like, um, like Siegfried and Roy, and they're like, "Oh, okay, gotcha." You could always you could always invoke Soul Caliber if need be. Yeah, there's Soul Caliber. Actually, the the I would say the titular origin of my name is from the Ring of the Nibelung, which is a famous opera and legendary Germanic uh, folktale. And so, interestingly, when I was in Japan, they know this um you know this opera really well they're kind of into western operas over there in japan mm -hmm. and so that's how most people recognize my name in japan but in america it's definitely siegfried and roy although i hope to, i hope to god no, nobody in japan tried to try to go through the entirety of the ring of the nibelung in one sitting <laughs> yeah, i don't know <laughs> it's awfully long i've never been able to watch the whole thing myself well whenever whenever they do actual performances of it um it's spread out over four days yeah, it's quite an event. It's a marathon, mm -hmm. much like our cinematic adventure paths. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and it's it's funny you bring up the Ring of the Nibelung because um, not too long ago a a um, a YouTuber who I fo who I follow, Mandalore, had done a video on a really weird adventure game that was trying to do a sci-fi take on that story called Ring. I oh, say, cool! I say I say weird because aside from the, aside from the fact that they they brought in a very interesting artist to work to work on the visual designs, um, but some of the voice acting has some very strange performances, perf yeah. including including one infamous one where it seems like he's going from normal to manic to no to normal just completely randomly. Wow! And I've I've sent that to some people some people who um. Who have done voice acting and they can't they can't go through the whole thing. <laughs> it's a little too painful. Yeah, I wonder. I mean, I imagine that might be you know because I've seen how voice acting gets done sometimes, and you know you get different directors and different takes, so they don't give the actor much guidance, and then later they cut everything right, and then when they cut, they realized oh we didn't you know we didn't actually ask him to do the right direction for these scenes, and then so it gets edited together in a crazy way. And you know, the actor may have had no idea what was happening, right? Uh, uh, so you never, you never know uh, how that happens, but it's um, I find it personally kind of amusing. I like disaster stories, so uh, yeah, that sounds like everybody, a good time. everybody likes a car, everybody likes a car crash. I've I've talked I've talked at length in the past about the sheer insanity of the creation of the film Heaven's Gate. Mm, yeah, 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 Which, totally. I th I think I think the final cut documentary is still up on YouTube, which goes into detail about it. Um, and disaster stories was what was what got me back into want into paying attention to certain sports. Oh, uh, okay. Because well, there there's always there's always every sport has that one has that one team or that one guy who is the unluckiest guy in the, is the unluckiest guy in the room or is run like a clown show. Like yep. In, in, oh, yeah. in basketball, it's the Knicks. In foot in football, I'd say it's the Browns because the Browns live in hell. Although I could make an argument for the Cowboys because they keep acting like they're America's team and they haven't done anything in twenty years. Um, in in Formula One, it's Ferrari. They are not a clown. They are the whole circus. <laughs> 
<laughs> they were so cool when I was a kid, though. I think the, I think the whole spy I think the whole Spygate scandal broke them. Yeah, probably. Um, uh, and yet, yeah, in the and in the early two thousands, they were kicking ass, but the, but one way or another, something ends up going wrong. <laughs> and I remember I remember Enzo Enzo saying that aerodynamic Enzo Ferrari saying aerodynamics are for people who can't make good engines. Yeah, <laughs> which kind of kind of shows where his thinking is at when everybody's when everybody's been using aerodynamics. I think I think since the eighties, probably even this. I'd say probably <clears throat> at er, at earliest the sixties. Yeah, that's always a, a, a you know a key moment of a disaster story when somebody with great hubris comes out and makes a statement, and you're like, oh no, oh no. Uh, I I remember one time I was at uh, Gen Con and uh, the people from Wizards of the Coast were presenting about Gleemax. I don't know if your listeners know the story I, of Gleemax. Oh, I know about it's a, it's a great disaster. It was sort of Wizards' first attempt to make a gaming portal and gaming-centered uh, kind of, um, you know, social network. And I, I, I used to be a software engineer for a long time, and they got up on stage, and they were talking about Gleemax, and, you know, which we were all like, well, it's an interesting name. I mean, I get it, but it's not that great. But then they, they said the key word, the, the, the disaster statement was, and we've been given such a huge budget, there's no way we can fail, right? <laughs> <laughs> As a software engineer, that is a huge red flag. If anybody thinks their budget is way more than they need or is a big budget, then the project is going to be a disaster, you know, because A, they're going to waste a lot of time and money, and, and B, they probably just don't know what they're talking about because there's never enough money in software engineering, right? You always wish you had more people and more time, so. you, I'm pretty sure you could hear me cringing as soon as you said that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's just, uh, I was just like, oh, well, they're doomed. I guess that's it. <laughs> like, uh, and indeed, they were. The, I, re the I realize it's, it's been a while, and some people have probably forgotten about this, but um, did everybody just conveniently forget about Waterworld? Oh, yeah, well, that's uh, another great disaster film. Which, in, in Both in, in, in context and in story, yeah. Well... The film itself isn't bad, it's just it was way, way, way too expensive and couldn't break even. Yeah, yeah, I, I enjoyed Waterworld. I mean, I like almost any apocalyptic film. I, You know, even the, the worst ones, I at least love the idea and the creativity that goes into it, right? Mm -hmm. And and Waterworld is no exception. I enjoyed it. It's, it's sort of objectively not very well made uh, in the end, but it was uh, it's still kind of a fun movie. I, I do yeah. enjoy it. So, with with Kong Skull Isle, with um, Isle of the Damned and Dominion of Iron, you are introducing what you call CAPs, Cinematic Adventure Paths. So right. I think, I think the first thing to to establish is what is what is the difference between a module in the in the traditional sense and a cap? Well, I think it is mostly just a matter of length and. The idea of a, an adventure path, which we can't claim to have invented, but uh, that's more of a Pathfinder thing, as far as I know, is a, a long campaign, really, that takes you from level 1 to whatever the max level in the game is. In our case, level 10. Uh, and so it is a full story arc that takes the heroes from their very beginnings, uh, facing... Uh, the kinds of dangers that Kong Skull Island and Pacific Rim are able to offer, which are quite formidable, uh, all the way to kind of mastery of their skills and abilities uh, and, you know, the, the mightiest foes available. So that's the idea of an adventure path. It's just sort of a full campaign. Um, probably would take, I think, you know, we estimated like 100 hours maybe for a group to get all the way through it, although I don't really know. Um, you know, these uh, projects are still being worked on, but the idea is they're uh, very big adventurous uh, and uh, will take your crew quite a while. They are divided up such that you can kind of play them in chapters. Uh, you don't have to sit down and, you know, crank through them all in a year or whatever it is. You can, you can spread it out as much as you want. But they really allow for a greater overarching story where there's a lot of development of the characters and a lot of things happen in the story and plot. Mm -hmm. 
So I think Pacific Rim is centered around uh, the very early days of that universe, so the emergence of the first kaiju, and the efforts of the governments of the world to try and reach consensus about how to stop them yeah. and what to do. And, um, you know, so the, the players will be going from country to country, trying to rally support, having to deal with political issues, while at the same time fighting off the kaiju that keep appearing. And threatening everybody, so we're thus with demonstrating the, the value of the program. So we're dealing with the formative days of the <clears throat> um, PPDC, right? Exactly. Yeah, and so the heroes will get a chance to have an impact uh, on at least their version of the Pacific Rim world and uh, kind of guide its destiny. Mm -hmm. uh, so they have a really big impact on what happens and and what takes place. Yeah, and I did. I'll f well, f I'll focus on Isle of the D Isle of the Damned first. Um, okay. Now you can you you end up going in you end up going into the into the gist of of certain thing of certain things. One thing I'm one thing I'm curious about is because of the because of the fact that a lot of it is a exploration is an exploration affair. Even with the new beast that you're that you're putting in, do you plan on putting in some sort of like an event table or a wandering monster table to um to help to help facilitate that exploration? Yeah, absolutely. So that's something you don't find in a lot of our products. But the in fact the the Kong Skull Island cinematic adventure has a few of these. Uh, based on the content of that book. But this is going to be a much bigger book, so it'll definitely have uh, random encounter tables, and they'll be significantly expanded from the ones that are available in the cinematic adventure. So it to include all the new creatures and different types of events that can occur. And so I think that'll definitely be part of it. There'll be a lot of set encounters. It's not going to be all a big hex scroll kind of a game. But because we want people to be able to explore anywhere on the island, and we're not going to detail every location on the entire island, that would be too big even for a cinematic adventure path, uh, you know, we want the ability uh, for Game Masters to have people explore and have emergent stories take place. So that's definitely going to be included. Mm -hmm. Now, it is, at the end of the day, st still a mystery story. And, mis and those are a tricky affair to ha to handle as as a gm um when it comes to handing out clues do you, um how do you for the, for the bigger mystery within it and i'm not i'm not asking for spoilers but but how do you plan on having out of the damn go about that yeah it's a good question i I'm, I'm not personally going to be writing the adventure but i often uh, edit and uh, provide feedback to the adventure writers. I'm mostly the the game mechanics guy, right? Uh, and so I'm not super heavily involved in the two legendary bundle adventure paths. Uh, I am as far as like as part of the team and being in the meetings and everything. But I'm not personally going to write a lot of the material. Yeah. But here's here's some of the advice I give to, to kind of adventure creators. One is that. If there is a clue that is essential for following the plot, like you need this clue to move forward, you do not want to like put that in a dice roll for the players. Or if you do put it in a dice roll for the players, put it in the dice roll early, and then you cannot avoid it later on. Because if it's essential to the plot, you don't want to leave that up to chance. Uh, because if they don't find it, then you're going to have to very awkwardly kind of force it on them. So you want to think about ahead of time the ways in which they can discover the secrets that you want them to discover and placing those sometimes in multiple places, not just in one location, right, but in multiple locations, and using psychology to draw people's attention to where the clue is, which means, you know, somebody might talk about the existence of said clue, <laughs> right, so let's say it's a battle plan, and they're like, oh, yeah, you know, you overhear a conversation where people are talking about the battle plan, right? And I'm like, oh, what battle plan is this? That sounds important. And so maybe we're going to look around for where the battle plans might be, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, as a game master, you think, well, where might battle plans be? And as an adventure writer, you can actually place the battle plans, even if there's only one set, in multiple locations. And where they really are is the first place that the players end up looking for them that is reasonable, if that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. So um, they could be in the lock cabinet, they could be in the secret compartment of the desk drawer, and they could be in the briefcase of the general, right? And whichever of those the players happen to encounter first is where they really are. 
And it's kind of a narrative trick, but it's one that will feel very natural for players and make sense in the storyline, so as long as you're rational about where you put things. Mm -hmm. um, so being fluid as a game master and as an adventure writer in order to tailor the experience to the player's decisions uh, is a great way to keep both keep player agency but also keep the plot going, if that makes sense. So people don't feel railroaded, but you are kind of using the levers of narrative storytelling in order to make sure things can work out in the way that they need to for the adventure to continue. On the other hand, uh, goodies that are not essential to the story, but enhance it or add something interesting or give the players unique advantages, those, I would say, I, I hard code into where they are in the adventure. And then it really is, if the players are clever and discover the thing, they get the benefit, right? If they don't, they ha don't happen to get that, and it makes things a little more challenging. Uh, but that way, they really they, you get the game mechanic feel where their decisions are going to matter in the outcome, but they aren't going to derail the whole campaign. Mm -hmm. Now... Kind of a long explanation. Yeah. <laughs> Well, like, like I said, this is this. There's a whole lot of traps when it comes to. Oh, did I lose you, Mildred? I guess not. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, there's a whole lot of traps that can happen when it comes to doing a mystery or mystery adjacent kind of story. Um. Especially since there's, especially since in something like this, there's always the question of do you, of um, and I'm using this, I'm using this as a bit of a pejorative. Do you stat dragons? <laughs> you know, because people, ha because there's the mindset of if it has stats, then people will try and kill it. Mm, yeah, yeah, true. Although I will say in Kong Skull Island, uh, the way the Titanic rules are written is, uh, look, you are not going to fight King Kong with your M16 or your rocket launcher or anything that you can tote around on your personal body. Not even a tank is really going to do that much to King Kong, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you have some Titanic scale weapon, some super technology or something, you can annoy him, you get his attention, uh, but you, you're not going to defeat him. It's just ridiculous, right? He's 300 feet tall. Uh, well, it depends on which stage of the movie you're in, but uh, by the time we're doing uh, Island of the Damned, he's you know 200 to 300 feet tall. So it's not going to happen. Um, and, but he does have stats, but they're really stats for him to fight other gigantic monsters. We do talk a lot about in the cinematic adventure, and in this information will be in the cinematic adventure path too, as to how to integrate the actions of the heroes with the actions of the giant monsters. Um, so, and, and how to let the players know that they're not going to fight King Kong uh, and, and get away with it, uh, or, you know, especially to defeat him. Um, without just being punishing to them, right? To do it in a fun way, um, so that he, you know, kicks their butt, but th they get a chance to live and fight another day. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I think you just like as a game master, you want to think like a player, right? And think, hey, if I was in this situation, what are some things that I would do? What if I was a crazy player? What if I was a smart player? What if I was a bored player, right? You know, like what are these these archetypes of players gonna react to in these situations? And be ready. Um, I often tell adventure writers, you know, they'll be like, okay, so now the heroes do this, right? And I'm like, no, 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 never say what the heroes do. Say what challenges they need to overcome. Right, so say, you know, that oh, the heroes will fix the car. Well, maybe they won't. Maybe they'll go steal somebody else's car. Maybe they're going to get a helicopter. Maybe one of them has a weird ability where they can summon a taxi. Like, a lot of, you know, that's not going to happen on Skull Island, but a lot of things are possible, and the heroes will find all kinds of weird ways to overcome the challenges. So don't plan how the heroes overcome the challenge. Just plan the challenge and plan what happens when they overcome the challenge. What's next, right? What's the next challenge for them? Uh, and, and you'll be a lot better off, because otherwise, if you rely your adventure on specific actions the heroes take, uh, the game master who's trying to run that adventure is going to be in a difficult situation when that doesn't happen, right? Uh, and, or they're going to have to hard railroad the players in a way the players are not going to feel very good. So, like, I, I'm all about you can make an adventure that has a linear path and it can be great. That's a little different than a railroad. A railroad is when you have to keep shoving the players back on the track. You know, a good linear adventure just naturally pulls them through the story. 
um, and and it doesn't require any force. They're they're just going to want to do the things that make sense to do, and the adventure will move along. But but you have to keep the framework. You have to keep the path from being too tightly controlled and too dependent on the player actions, or it's going to be be problematic. Yeah. Now, with that with that in with that in mind. Uh, I would like to sh I would like to shift into Dominion of Iron for a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do remember one of the things that I that I had asked was was uh, was on the notion of the creation and use of Jaegers because in in uh, obviously in the source material there's the whole thing of of um, a two pilot setup because the feedback on one pilot was too much. So one for, one for each side. Um, is that something that you that you plan on carrying into this, or do you have a different approach? Yeah, no, that's absolutely still the case. Um, the rules that we wrote for the cinematic adventure are going to be the same for the cinematic adventure path, because these are you know the these uh, legendary bundle is really focused on the adventures themselves. Mm -hmm. They will include the rules necessary to play in the adventure that were first published in the cinematic adventures, mm -hmm. but uh, they're going to have expansions on that and extra choices especially with pacific rim there'll be lots of early tech items that don't necessarily appear in the book they'll actually be a little bit worse right but then you have a lot of progression to go to build up your jaeger but the basic technology of having two pilots is totally central to both the gameplay mechanics that uh chris put together that's uh chris goober ramsley who's the game designer on uh, pacific rim uh, and, uh, you know, to the setting itself, right? And I gotta say, like, it's one of my favorite mechanics in all of our cinematic adventures. The experience of piloting uh, the Jaegers with your partner is uh, its just really fun and it's really unique. There are very few role-playing games where you're gonna take the powers of the two different characters and coordinate them for play, right? Because you're both moving together, you're attacking together, yet all the individual abilities of your characters uh, are important and can be used while in the Jaeger. Uh, and so it's really a cool partnership of, okay, I'm gonna help with my movement skills, get you into position so that you can use your combat abilities to really mess that guy up, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and it's just a lot of fun. I love playing it with my wife um, because it's it really feels like a true partnership when you're playing together, uh, piloting a Jaeger, and uh, that's just a it's a very unique role playing experience, and I think it's it's super fun. Yeah. Now, I suppose if you if you're if you're dickering a lot with your partner, that might not be so great, but that would actually make for some really fun role playing. And the the mechanics of the game support that when you're in your mental link. Uh, it's possible to roll poorly and have a real dissonance going on, and uh, that's a fun thing to role play. Mm -hmm. And I'm get, I'm, I'm get. It would be easy. It would be easy to say that it's a case of bo of both parties ro rolling, but I'm guessing that's not exactly the case, since obviously, obviously, for a good chunk of people, they're j they're going to be jumping into this straight, um, without ha without having the original cinematic adventure. So I think. I think going into how the link works within the Everyday Heroes format is so is something that we should go over. Yeah, sure. So um, basically, at the start of when you fire up your Jaeger and you're getting ready for combat at the very beginning, you're going to make a roll for your link quality. And so both players are going to be making an ability score check. And depending on the results that they get, if they both score really well, then they have a really high link quality. And if they both score really poorly, then they have a low link quality. If somebody rolls a one and the other person fails, they end up doing something which is called chasing the rabbit, which means they get lost inside each other's psyche, which means they're not going to be doing the combat. Instead, they're going to be doing some role playing about the character's past uh, to try and get out of this fugue state and get back into the fight, right? Um, and while they're fighting, if the if the uh, Jaeger takes critical hits, and in certain other situations, uh, certain creatures have an ability to challenge people's uh, psychic link, then they're going to have to make this check again, or the 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 quality of their uh, their link could go down, or it can go up if you get a critical hit or a cool moment or something like that. So, um, and 
The way the link quality works is, let's say you've got a really high link quality and you're going to make an attack. Well, both of the players, the Jaeger is, let's say, shooting its plasma cannon. Mm -hmm. Both of the players in the Jaeger are going to make separate attack rolls for their character based on their skills and abilities, right? And if they both hit, then both of them get to use their character's combat abilities, bonus damage or advantage on attacks, whatever happens to be on that attack. So it's going to be really powerful, right? If only one of them hits and the other misses, then what happens is, and all the, I should also say, all the Jaeger weapon damage is um, biurnal. So it has like 2d6, 2d8, 2d12 type damage. Mm -hmm. So if, if both of you hit, you both roll a d12. If one of you hits, only you're doing half damage, essentially. Only the player that hit is rolling their part of the weapon damage, right? Uh, and also only that player can apply their abilities to the attack or their talents to the attack. Um, so when you have a, a good link quality, it gives you more advantage to get a situation where both of you are applying everything possible onto the attack. And if you have poor link quality, uh, then what happens is like, you know, if, if either of you fail, then the attack just completely fails. As where if you're at normal link quality, if one of you hits, then that person still hits. And if you're at very high link quality, uh, it, it gives the other person a chance to roll again and, and score a hit. So, um... It really affects the quality of your attacks and damage when your link quality is high or low. And of course, if it gets really low, all kinds of problems start to mm -hmm. start to happen. So yeah. Um. Now, when it comes to when it comes to building ja building Jaegers, um, I get I get this. I had mentioned beforehand the last time I had you on that it's that it's as tempting as it would be to build them like you would a standard vehicle. I get the sense that's not what you guys had in mind. Not, not entirely. Yeah, that's right. So we do have vehicle rules in Everyday Heroes, the core rule system, but those are really based on action movies, so they're really intended for motorcycles and cars and boats and things like that, mm -hmm. and, and aimed for chase scenes more than combat with weapons, right? Um, you can certainly shoot and blow up cars, but the, the model is very simple. With the Jaegers, it's uh, considerably more advanced, but we didn't want it to be... A super complicated system. We wanted the heroes that you build in Everyday Heroes to really shine through the system. So building a Jaeger involves a couple different elements. One is the the frame of the Jaeger. So there are bigger and smaller Jaegers, and smaller Jaegers have uh, less uh, ability to put on heavy components, right? So there's sort of a tonnage limit, a little bit like BattleTech or something, right? For, so if you have X Jaeger framework, then uh, you can put so many components. But there's also a kind of a drain quality, I think it's called drain, where um, it takes the psychic energy of the pilots in order to be able to operate the Jaeger. And if the drain gets heavier than the pilot's ability, then they can't effectively control it anymore. Their link quality goes down and their performance goes down. So, and because drain can get added sometimes through the effects of some of the kaiju and different things that can happen, it is possible to sort of start to lose control of your Jaeger. So you might want to run a Jaeger that's got a little wiggle room there so you're not right at your maximum limit all the time with it. But then again, maybe you want to do that in order to just come out of the gate as powerful as possible. But you might be vulnerable to a little bit more. So there's sort of a, a strategic choice there. But it's also intended to be a leveling mechanic so that um, if you're a low-level character and your sort of psychic limit is a little bit lower, then you can't pilot the very biggest, most powerful Jaegers. It takes leveling up to be able to handle the, the really heavy machinery in the game, right? And the, the most powerful weapons and the most powerful stuff. So this way you get a feeling of progression that is semi-tied to your character level. Now, you might be a really powerful ca character stuck in a weaker Jaeger, right, that doesn't have all the equipment. But you're still going to have all your character's class talents and things. So you're still going to be a lot better as a strong character in a weak Jaeger than a weak character in a weak Jaeger. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, and you could pilot a, a more powerful Jaeger, but you're just going to have, you're going to be struggling and that's going to make you weaker and thus make the whole thing more balanced. So it's a pretty simple system. It just sort of has the tonnage and then the, the, the drain. 
Um, but together, they really make a, a nice matrix of different power levels that give both the players and the game masters a lot to play around with in the, in the course of the game. And to really, because it's a role-playing game, we want a feeling of progression, right? That's tied to your character progression. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that all fits together real nicely. So building a Jaeger is pretty easy. You basically, you have a chassis that's made available by the story or by the game master. Um, or, you know, you could set in a bigger campaign. I don't know what they're going to do for the campaign. We've talked about different ideas. They might be kind of tracking the budget that you have, which will give you access to new technologies. But also new technologies will unlock as the story goes on. Uh, in order to build more and more powerful Jaegers. And so if the game master is setting up their campaign like this, um, you could do that, and so, and then just within the weight limit, within the the strain limit, you can pick which equipment is going to go into the Jaeger. Uh, they're pretty versatile, so there's not a lot of limitations on. Oh, these guys can't have these weapons, things like that. Um, it's just based on those two two defining stats. So it's pretty easy to put them together, but there are tons of choices for components that you can put on that are going to synergize with the player in the Jaeger as well as with fighting a specific type of enemy or something like that. Yeah. In that same in that same vein, uh, I'm guessing I'm guessing that you guys will be putting you guys will be putting in a custom sheet just for um, tracking a a um, the setup of a Jaeger. Yeah, that's right, and and those are I believe available somewhere, but maybe not yet. We definitely made specific character sheets, even just for the cinematic adventure. We have some Jaeger character sheets. And because because the Kong Skull Island's just going out, I'm not sure where those are available, but they should be available on our website. And if nothing else, you can always come to the Discord, and uh, we can help you find things. But so we both have character sheets, and we have specific Jaeger sheets for uh, Pacific Rim. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that, in, with that in mind. I remember in the in the first film they had a, there was an, the establishment of a category system, you know, ch you know, likening kaiju appearances to deg to degrees of hurricanes, and I th and a lot of the yeah. imagery of it was very much trying to channel the the idea of hurricanes, squalls, a lot of sea a lot of seaborne um, natural disasters. Yeah, and when it comes. Do you have do you have plans on on carrying that over as far as what as far as what the equivalent of e of each category would be would be within the framework of everyday heroes? Yeah, absolutely. So we um, we have that, and 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 there's a little bit of that in Kong Skull Island as well. It's not as formal there. Uh, it was interesting because, like you know, there is no lowest category for. Uh, the kaiju, so like the very first kaiju that ever appears, actually does not have a category like that, which was a little difficult as game designers. And we're like, what do you mean it doesn't have a category? We have to put everything into a category. Um, so there's a couple kaiju that kind of don't fit in because of storyline reasons. They were never given an official designation. And because this takes place at the very beginning, that's true here too. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, and they are roughly analogous to CR levels right in the 5e system so to determine how strong or powerful they are um and so we we just kind of integrate the game mechanic into that world uh viewpoint and merge those together into one system mm -hmm. i can i can certainly get that now with within that within that within all of that um one thing that I'm, one thing that i'm curious about is how is um within the within um everyday heroes you had that you had that mixture of class and art of class and archetype which we talked about beforehand um do you guys have any plan any plans on putting um archi archetypes or any character creation um step that's exclu that would be ex that would be setting exclusive to either skull island or pacific rim no, I don't think so. We didn't have to do that for the cinematic adventures, and we're not going to add a lot of... There will be new rule elements, as I like to say, in the cinematic adventure paths, meaning new equipment and, and new feats, probably, and some stuff like that. Um, but we probably won't be adding a lot of new rules for the adventure paths. They're mostly focused on the adventure. So only the ones that are... Most of the ones that are already in the cinematic adventures themselves will appear in the adventure paths, I believe... 
uh, these these products haven't been fully finished yet, right? So we have outlines and plans for everything, but they haven't been completed yet. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what they're going to put in there, but I don't think so. In Highlander and in uh, Total Recall, we introduced a new mechanic to the game called Origin, which is another step in the, the character creation process. Origin is basically what D&D would call race originally, or they call species now, right? So it's for playing robots, or in these cases, playing mutants in Total Recall, or playing immortals in Highlander. Uh, and so we added in that mechanic called Origin, the way it works in Everyday Heroes is that it's part of ability score generation. So your origin will have instructions on the different ways you can create ability scores for them uh, and for all three systems. So we offer both the, the array system, a point by system, and uh, rolling dice. And so it'll have instructions on how to create ability scores for that origin and then it will have the special unique abilities advantages and disadvantages associated with that origin so as you can imagine immortals have a lot of advantages aka they cannot die they can heal from wounds they have a lot of nice things going for them uh, and so they have lower ability score generation to start with like they get less points to work with or a little bit weaker array or slightly worse dice rolls than the standards uh, in order to help offset and balance them. Um, and it, the system works pretty well. It's interesting, too, because like with the array mechanic, uh, you can actually just give people a kind of a different spread. So some origins can have a little bit more even distribution. Some can have a little bit more min maxi distribution. So you can also play around with kind of the character. We never tell people, oh, these people are always strong or always smart or that sort of thing. You still get to kind of choose where you're going to put the ability scores. Mm -hmm. But we can work a little bit of a different character into... Uh, a, you know, a creature, like if, if you're a mechanical creature, right, maybe you're a little more evenly distributed, right, because you don't want to build a weakness into a robot, mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing. So uh, so it, it turned out to be a really interesting mechanic because it really let us play around and it let us really balance mechanics in an interesting way. And, you know, we could give higher or lower maximum starting ability scores and things like that to just create a nice, fairly well-balanced uh, character. But the other nice thing is it fits perfectly into the system we already have because you just say, oh, the standard way you generate ability scores, that's the human baseline origin, right? Um, and so that's was already baked into the rules. We didn't know it. That was not planned originally. It was just something that we managed to make it work out that way through a fair amount of trial and error until we came up with the idea. Oh. But it uh, works pretty well. But Kong Skull Island, Pacific Rim, the heroes are pretty much always human. So, But if you want to mix genres and you want to, let's say you're doing Pacific Rim Shadowrun or something, right? Uh, well, that's a mechanic you could use in order to introduce elves and orcs and things into the Pacific Rim universe. Um, and that's also something we'll be doing heavily with our... Um, Everyday Arcana project, which is our spiritual successor to Urban Arcana. And so we'll be using that mechanic a lot in that book. Mm -hmm. And the now with that with that in mind, um, when it comes to when it comes to the when it came when it came to when it came to the kaiju, um, eventually the more the more adva the more advanced types would have some more unorthodox ways of combat instead of just instead of just brute forcing everything or in some cases using bre using um breath weapons because because well point well point well point of origin <laughs> yeah um is are you going to be expanding on that concept with the kaiju you're going to be adding I think so. That's one of those areas I'm not going to be doing that, and I don't generally... I did do the monsters for Skull Island, but I, I, I don't like doing NPC and monster generation very much. Uh, I love coming up with the ideas. I don't like actually statting them out that much. It's not my favorite activity in game design. So other people tend to do that. You know, They're excited about it, so I'm like, you go ahead and, and take care of it. So I don't know. We've got pictures of some of the new kaiju on the Kickstarter page. So we've got the Bite Mantle, the Gyrax, the Oppressor, Jotar, a Steel Horn, and Steel Tanker. Uh, and so these creatures, I'm sure, will have some interesting and cool abilities. Uh, 
Goober, aka Chris Ramsley, uh, who's the game designer, is really creative and he loves making monsters. So I'm sure they will have really interesting abilities. The Jotar definitely looks like, and the Bite Mantle have like glowing something going on inside their mouths. So I have a feeling that they are able to uh, unpack some breath weapons, but I am not sure. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to finding out, however. But we definitely try to make each monster, especially when it's a giant kaiju or monster, have a very distinct feel, a character to it, if you will, right? So that it's just not a bag of hit points with an attack on it. Um, it does something interesting. Now, like when we're doing, I'm doing Rambo right now, we have a lot of NPCs that are just a person with a gun and some hit points, right? They, you know, Rambo mows them down by the hundreds. Um, so we have some very generic NPCs and then, you know, some really interesting marquee villains that, that are leading these bad guys. But in Kong Skull Island and in Pacific Rim, the monsters are arguably stars of the show. So they need to be big bads that have a very particular feeling, uh, a really cool look and cool mechanics that when you fight them, you're like, oh, it's a bite mantle. We're going to have to do X, Y, Z, or it's going to do the other thing to us, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Mm -hmm. I do remember that you, that we, we had talked, we had talked a bit, a bit about, and kind of dipped into the idea of this type of um, Titanic scale when it comes to combat is when you mention that the first thing that, it, that ends up coming to mind is things like mega damage from rifts though. Fortunately, we're not do we're not doing all the other things with rifts. That is the reason why that game's my whipping boy. Um, but <laughs> yeah. I want to go into a bit of the Titanic scale. Is it a case where you're just um, convert? Where you're just it's a measurement of da of damage, or is it a, or is it something different? Yeah. So I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but the way we did Titanic scale is essentially the same as regular scale in that uh, the way monsters are statted is essentially the same, and the heroes that you're playing when they're inside of a Jaeger have the same number of hit points and do the same amount of bonus damage, etc. So, and this turned out to be a really good decision because it just makes everything work, right? So if you wanted to say you're doing Kong Skull Island, and for whatever reason, you want uh, Tiamat to be one of the Titans, right? Go grab the stats for Tiamat, and now it's a Titan. Uh, the only thing that really changes the movement scale is not measured in feet, and ranges are not measured in feet. They're measured in spaces, which is, you know, a square on a grid, right? So instead of a range of 30 feet, it would be six spaces. So that's the only real conversion that you have to do to go from regular scale to Titanic scale. Now, there is, we do offer, like, if you want to do damage to a Titan and you are not Titanic scale, well, you need to do 100 points of damage to do one point of damage. There are almost no heroes that can do 100 points of damage to anybody in a single attack, right? So, basically, the answer is you can't. And, and it works the other way. So if a Titan does, if Kong does six points of damage, it's actually 600 points of damage. So you're dead. Right, like, you're gone, instant death rule, it's over, right? So you cannot really fight between Titanic scale and normal scale because the scaling is such that you just lose yep. and you, or you don't have any effect, right? Um, now, we have talked in another game that I can't really talk about, but one of our many projects we have on the back burner, there's a, a sort of a bridge scale for very large but not Titanic things, Um and in that game, there is a, a bridge scaling, and so it's 10x between the scales. And there it is reasonable. You, you know, there are characters that could do 50, 60 points of damage, which would be five, six points of damage in this middle scale. But we don't have that for Kong or for um, uh, Pacific Rim. It's kind of all or nothing. Um, but the, the fact that we're really using the same mechanics and the same numbers means that there's a whole lot of flexibility. Like, you could shrink one of the kaiju down, or let's say you're just playing an everyday heroes game, you don't want a titanic scale uh, Godzilla. You take the stats for Godzilla, and you just treat them as normal, uh, and then it's just a, you know, sort of a norm, well, a very large, but not building-sized atomic lizard that you could fight, right? Mm -hmm. So... 
it just makes the material really applicable to different things people want to do with it. Um, and uh, I really like that economy. And it also just means we, the same abilities that you can use as a regular character in Everyday Heroes, you can use in your Jaeger, right? Because it gives you the muscle, it gives you the, the, the size to do the things you would normally do as a hero. So if you're a martial arts expert and you jump into a Jaeger, your Jaeger does martial arts, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you can make unar better unarmed attacks and, and make them faster. Um, so doing the scaling that way just gave us a huge amount of creative freedom and that made the game feel a whole lot richer because we don't have to make up new stuff for everything. But, you know, we, we do give the Game Master advice, like, you know, like, it's a titanic battle, you need to describe it in titanic ways with falling buildings and crashing waves, and you, just because the mechanics are the same doesn't mean it feels the same. It, it still feels differently. And we intentionally, for Pacific Rim, the movement rates are a little bit slower for Jaegers and uh, the, the Kaiju as compared to what most normal scale bad guys have. And that's just sort of almost a psychological trick to make it feel bigger, right? We don't do that so much in Kong Skull Island because Kong, if you watch the movies, he can move really fast, right? Like, um, so if you were to take Kong over into Pacific Rim, he would be a very fast um, kaiju, right? He would be moving at high speed compared to a lot of the Pacific Rim kaiju. Yeah, I met, yeah. <laughs> imagine, imagine putting... Up. Pitting Kong, pitting Kong up against the first the first kaiju in the um, first film. <laughs> yeah, I think it would be a lot of fun, right? Like, and it's totally a thing you can do. And even though in Kong Skull Island, one of our directives of uh, you know writing the game, we're not allowed to make Kong be a bad guy or to have the players fight against Kong. He's supposed to be an ally for humanity, and we write him that way. But in your games, you can do anything you like, right? And uh, so if you want Kong to fight the kaiju, you can totally do that. We're not allowed to write that, but we want to make it possible for you to do that. Because obviously, obviously, once it's in the hands of whatever table is going to be running it, it's out, it's out of your hands. Yeah, exactly. We try to emphasize that that you know I write these books, the cinematic adventures and these cinematic adventure paths, to be as faithful as possible to the license that we're doing. But at the same time, we tell the players very explicitly, like this is the world of the film. Your world can be different. Right, you can do things a little differently if you want to. Like in Highlander, I talk about the prize. Right, this is what the prize is in the film, but in your world, the prize could be something very different. Right, uh, and so that's that's up to you, and it's something you can use to make your story work well and and work better. So, which is cert is certainly a good is certainly a good move because I've I've seen a few. I'm not going to name names, although anybody who's watch this who's watched this channel long enough will might be able to figure it out but i've seen a few ttrpg adaptations of ips that hyper focused on try on trying to on trying to replicate the ip and not the world the ip takes place in yeah um if i want if i want to use a really early example of this kind of thing and i and i'm i'm only using this example because it's long out of print and nobody's going to nobody's going to yell at me about it <laughs> um, it was a good move the TS. There's a reason most people were pl if they were playing an Indiana Jones RPG, they were playing the West End Games one and not the TSR one. Mm, yeah, yeah. The TSR one had no character creation set up. It just ha it just had character sheets of the characters from the films, which yep. even back then got roasted over an open flame for yeah, the, that exact thing. Yeah, and I think you know, it was interesting when we first started, when I first talked to Dave, who's the owner of the company, about this game, and he pitched it to me, right? And he's like, I want to make a game. It's, it's playing the movies. Have you ever watched a movie? People did something you thought was stupid, and you wanted them to do something else. Well, that's my game. I'm like, okay, I see. And so I wrote him a pitch, and it was kind of a little more like that old TSR thing, and it was very much like, you know, you had scenes, and the game master was a director rather than a game master, and, and it, it played out like a movie, because that's just kind of what I understood. He was like, no, that's not what I want at all. All, right he's like i just want like D, D, but it's die hard i'm like oh okay 
Like, I'm a writer that you're paying, right? So my job is to write the game that you want to make. And I thought that's a better game, right? I just assumed from the way he described it, he wanted something that was very movie-focused, right? And and you were in the movie. Um, and so once I understood that's not what he wanted, I changed my pitch and I got the job, right? You know, he's like, oh, no, okay, that's what I want. I'm like, great. I, I want to make the game you want. And I think it was a really good decision, right? That Yeah, our things are not the movie. It is the world of the movie. Um, and we talk about stuff from the movie because I also want the books to serve as if you're a fan of the thing, even if you don't play the game, you could pick up the book and you'll get little bits of lore and cool new stuff and, and details about the characters and the monsters from the film, right? So I want them to work on that level. But for the players and the game masters, you know, yeah, no, it's, it's your world now. You take it in whatever direction you want, right? These are all the tools to make it feel like the world of the film, uh, but we totally expect you to expand on that and go in your own crazy directions. Same with our adventure writers. We tell them, like, okay, there are some guidelines you have to follow, and it's got to feel like the film franchise, but you're making a sequel or a prequel, right? It's your story, and you're going to make characters, and you're going to make monsters and, and, and make original content for this world. Uh, and so it's it's good fun. Of course, studio sometimes comes back and goes, yeah, that doesn't follow our naming convention. Or uh, I think we were doing this the cinematic adventure, and they're like, mm, some of your monsters aren't weird enough. We want them to be weirder. <laughs> we're like, okay, we'll make them weirder. Uh, so um, you know, we definitely work with the studios uh, to make sure their IP is respected. Yeah. Although to be fair, being told being told your monster isn't weird enough is a good problem to have. Yeah, definitely. Like it's uh, you know the only problem is then we got to redo some of the artwork, which is kind of expensive. But uh, yeah, no, I absolutely. I'm like, oh, you want it weird than that? Well, okay, well that's great, right? I'm I'm very happy, happy to happy to make it stranger. So yeah, we have the the giant singing ants that are kind of famous because they're talked about in the film Kong Skull Island, but you never see them. Uh, and uh, so we, we made those uh, a big part of it. And in the end, they were like, no, make the ants stranger. And so now they've got glowing abdomens and, and kind of branch, like, three like antenna and all kinds of strange things about them. So they, they got quite a bit weirder uh, rather than just sort of giant scary ants. Mm -hmm. So as I, as I understand it, um, the... The um, Dominion of Iron that's going to be a that's going to be 160 pages, and um, with along with the 64 page guide for building and le leveling um, Jaegers, and um, Kong Sk and um, Isle of the Dam Isle of the Damned is going to be 160 pages with the 64 page um, bestiary. Um, do you f do you foresee and do you foresee any um any stretch goals in the in the next few in the next few days expanding upon that or are most of the stretch goals you had in mind already unlocked uh it's certainly possible uh, you know for this project we've kind of kept the stretch goals partly secretive um and I'll be honest that's partly so that we can make sure most of them get unlocked, right? You know, because you're never sure exactly where your thing's going to go. And, you know, you make a lot of plans ahead of time. And really, honestly, we kind of want fans to get all the goodies, you know, but we also want to entice people to keep pledging and spread the word about the adventure. So we're experimenting a little bit here by keeping things a little uh, close to the vest. But we, we do have some icons. We have some miniatures coming up at higher levels. Um, of course, we, we, could, we do have to hit a certain financial level, to make printing miniatures, uh, you know, not lose us money. Uh, so that those do kind of have a hard monetary cap, but we're trying to keep it flexible. Mm -hmm. We're not putting in a lot of stretch goals for uh, adding new monsters. We do have a couple of those, uh, the ones that are upcoming here. And I, yeah, they're unlocked now. The Rock Bugs and the Yank Bone uh, for uh, Pacific Rim are going to be... Uh, unlocked and, and additions to the game. Of course, we you know we sort of plan to include the stretch goals most of the time. Sometimes we'll have a really high stretch goal that's like, well, only if we get there should can we undertake that madness. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to adding things to the book, you know, we want to get them all in. We uh, with our first one, we had a little trouble because you know we had classes and we'd written the classes and they were all ready to go. 
And a couple of them were like, man, we're not going to get it unlocked. That's not good. So we, we, you know, like we made to get to the last one was like 400K and we got to like 395 or something. And we're like, you know, whatever, it's unlocked, right? Like you're getting it anyhow. So uh, we want to give people the, the maximum value. But we also want the excitement of a, of a, you know, stretch goals and things yeah. to unlock so people can celebrate. So there's kind of a balance there. Mm -hmm. uh, but we definitely you know, want people to have all the goodies. So we're going to, we're going to pack those pages with as much good content as possible and no filler. That's another one of my battle cries is like no filler, right? Everything needs to matter. Yeah. Uh, so, Oh, and I, I know it's not on, I know it's not on there at, at this time, but do you guys have plans on, um, on giving out of the, out of the damned and dominion of iron, um, virtual tabletop support? Yeah, we'd like to. Um, you know, with the first Kickstarter, we had Roll20 for everything. The Roll20 implementation proved to be uh, more difficult, I suppose, than we were led to believe it would be. Uh, and so it's taken a lot longer and been considerably more expensive than we anticipated. And so for this one, and, and because it was the one area we didn't meet our time commitments on on the first one, we didn't want to automatically include that in this uh, Kickstarter because, you know, we really have an ethos of if we promise you something, we damn well are going to deliver it, right? Um, hell or high water. Uh, and so we just don't want to make promises that we are uncertain about our ability to do. Now, sometimes you kind of have to, to try, you know, like you have to reach a little hard. Um, and we did that with the first one. Uh, but the VTTs were an area that was just a little hard to guarantee. So we absolutely want to have that support and we intend to do it, but we didn't want to make the promise, if that makes sense, because we're still trying to meet that promise from the first Kickstarter. So we didn't think it was fair to, to promise something that would be backlogged by something else, right? Um, so that's just a little bit of a challenge we have, but it's something we totally want to do. We just need to find, I guess what you might say, like faster partners who can produce that content for Roll20. We don't have anybody in-house who's a Roll20 implementer, um, so we have to rely on contractors for that. And I guess we just haven't found, I mean, the contractors we have, I don't want to say anything bad about them, right? It's just the task was more difficult than was imagined. Uh, and so uh, we don't want to reach too far. Now, we probably will because we're going, you know, we promised to have Roll20 implementations of the cinematic adventures themselves. And they're using the same rules as the cinematic adventure paths. So I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. Um, we just didn't want to say it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date, but just a ballpark. Mm, you know, I'm going to have to say I don't know on that. Um, you know, my my work is mostly game design. I know it will not be in 2023, right? So it'll be sometime in 2024, uh, and I don't know exactly when. Generally speaking, you know, we'll get PDFs out to people about two, three months before it shows up in stores. Uh, and so, yeah, but I am not sure. So I would expect it sometime in the middle of 2024. I'm looking at the Kickstarter here to see if there's any dates, but I doubt we've put them in other than something pretty general about when it's going to come out. Just because we're, this one is being kickstarted a little earlier in the development process than we did with the first Kickstarter. In that one, we had written the core rule book by the time the Kickstarter started, and we'd always planned the cinematic adventures to come out over the course of a year. So we had a, a general idea on that. Uh, on this one, it's just a little earlier, so it's a little early. It's a little more difficult for us to like pin a month down for when this comes out. There's a bit too many variables still happening. Um, there's a lot of art that we need to make for this, uh, so uh, and that's always a little bit difficult to judge how long the art's going to take to come in. But it'll be in 2024 for sure. Uh, you know, probably middle of 2024. I'm sure we'd love to have these coming out around the time of Gen Con. So. And I will certainly be looking forward to it. Uh, but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. 
Excellent. Well, thank you so much for having me, and I, I'm happy to come on anytime, talk about stuff Evil Genius is doing, or you know, just anything that you want to talk about in the the world of gaming. Because um, uh, I just like to talk about games. It's my hobby. It's my life. It's my job now too. So it's on my brain twenty four seven. Um, and also want to invite you know any fans who want to reach out and ask me questions or um, find out things we're doing, or if you want to write for Evil Genius games or anything like that. Feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I love to talk to people. Uh, sometimes I'm pretty busy, but most of the time uh, I'm happy to make time to chat, chat with people, give advice, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And of course, and of course, a sincere thanks that goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers, present and not present. My name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!